Okay, we can get started. Everyone, this is um, CKPI call uh, for October 31st. I'm going to paste the link in the chat if you can add your name to the attendees. Okay, so for today, uh, I have some follow-ups from our um, last discussions. And um, I also have one question for Edward at the end. So I'll get started uh, with, with my follow-ups. So in the October 17th meeting, uh, we discussed that alpha features that are introducing API fields to stable API, it might be okay for them to break it. We will not formally commit to uh, preserving compatibility there, but for beta and um, GA versions, uh, we will commit to preserving compatibility. So <clears throat> one of the open action items was to uh, find a place in this uh, proposal uh, to to put that. Uh, so uh, as a goal of this proposal, I have added uh, one more item, which is to establish a policy for um, API evolution. And then at the end, I have documented the exact discussion we had uh, in this call. So the three, three main bullet items is that alpha features should always introduce optional fields to APIs that have GA or are in beta. Um, I'll clear this using an example in, in the next agenda item uh, for this call. Uh, the second one is that since alpha features are not um, guaranteeing uh, compatibility, users should not deploy it in production. This is one of the conclusions that we came to. And I have also added a small uh, caution here that even though these are experimental and alpha features and not strictly requiring backward compatibility, breaking it should not, done, not be done lightly. Uh, we should still care for the users using these features. Um, and this is how exactly it was worded in the uh, Kubernetes um, document um, that that we have in our links links um, that that we are all aspiring to. So this is what I have added, and then the last bullet point: uh, beta and GA features should introduce new fields, um, but should never break uh, compatibility. Yeah, I want to take a pause here. Um, does this, you know, accurately summarize the discussion we had until now? Yes. Okay. Awesome. So I don't know if we if this documentation will suffice, or we will eventually land these bullet items into user facing or even uh, contributing docs. But for now, this is where I uh, have started and this will serve as a policy for um, at least CKPI calls. Uh, yeah, then call. it's, uh, is, is there a different section or in this section that we need to add that the beta can be dropped eventually, like completely? Like, like Kubernetes are there. Uh, I think that's, so that's a question I had for you actually is we were mentioning that um, there is a, a feature evolution discussion going on, right? So um, I would like for us to uh, include that discussion and 
whatever conclusion we have from that discussion will decide on where uh, the feature flag evolution goes uh, in terms of documentation from that discussion. That's what my thoughts were. Okay, so we will. I will try to move that whole discussion in here. So for the, maybe for the next meeting, I'll add the topics from there. Okay, sounds good. And um, yeah, if if this is happening in a different call, I can also um, start attending that. Please share the meeting. No, no, office. we will move it to here. And that uh, we didn't have that call for a long time, so we need to move it, it to here. Okay. Awesome. Let me make a note. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think that's the update I had for this proposal. Uh, the second bullet point, um, which which is largely inspired from this, right? So here we talk about uh, compatibility and not breaking compatibility. But what is the exact definition of uh, compatibility? So I found a very precise and accurate uh, description of what compatibility means in uh, Kubernetes API uh, documentation. And here are the, the six bullet points which are uh, worth discussing, discussing. And the context for this is, if this sounds good to everyone, uh, we could have some kind of uh, definition of compatibility um, inspired from here uh, included in the uh, proposal document itself. But before going forward and adding that, I wanted to discuss it out loud here in this call so we can you know pick and choose uh, pick and choose the the bullet points that are important for us. So um, with that context, I'm going to start. Um, you know, reading out and and going through each of this uh, compatibility definition uh, bullet points. Uh, the first is that any API call that had succeeded before the change must succeed after the change. So what this this means is that older clients um, should continue to work. At least my understanding is that older clients should continue to work with uh, newer server. Uh, any API call that does not use your change must behave the same way as it did before. So this takes into account uh, the patch and the update calls that are issued from older clients. So um, the patch call means that fields are selectively taken from the API. Update call means that the entire object is submitted to the uh, API uh, directly. And I think what this bullet point spe specifies is that older API clients who issue patch and update calls should continue to work with a uh, newer API server. And both of these points are important because during an upgrade, uh, we have a temporary situation where we have newer clients, but uh, older API server and vice versa. The third uh, bullet point, uh, API call that uses your change must not cause problem, crash or degrade when issued against API server that does not include your change. So this reverses the, uh, the version skew here, the uh, API server is older, but the clients are newer. So um, in the first two, it was the other way around. Fourth, it must be possible to round trip your change, convert to different API version with no loss of information. I think this is important because what Kubernetes, Kubernetes does internally is for its core API, 
it converts all the versions into its own internal version. So let's say you have v1, v2, v3 pod. It will convert it to an internal API dot pod. And then from there, it will convert back to whatever uh, version is stored in the in HCD. So I think what this means is that once you issue a call, you should convert from an API version to an internal version. And from there, read it back to uh, the API version or a different API version. I am, I, I think this point for us might not make a not, lot of sense, but I need to go check how uh, KubeWord API converts things into internal version and stores it. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if this is uh, applicable as is to us. We don't we don't do anything special there. Um, okay. Basically, our API is still dragging, so we don't have something like beta, alpha, and then graduated to GA. Um, so at least for now, it's uh, no point for us. Well, uh, we this point does not really care about beta alpha or GA, right? It cares about whether or not you store uh, the transformation of those alpha version into an internal version or not. So that's what we need to check. Yeah, so it, it works like if you have, for example, beta one of VM and then you have also like uh, V1 of VM object. Yes. Yes. You can only store one version in the ETC, uh, and that's basically all the time the new one. And uh, but you you still need to be able to read the beta one version through the REST API. Um, yep. And as I say, we should be keeping the API same as of now. So I think uh, we should not be impacted by this. Oh, maybe okay. the it's like we don't have. To servers. That's I think that's the point. Oh, right. It's not about okay. the. It's not about the server. It's about the version of the CRD. Yeah, but we don't keep two two versions of CRD. We keep only one. Well, we have the V one uh, alpha free, and then we have the V one. Today we have two. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I think what that means is because we have two, that means we 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 definitely have to convert them to an internal representation so that they are uh, linkable. Uh, so I'll reword that. Let's say you create a object with v1 uh, API and then read from v1 alpha three that create and read call should still succeed. And for that to happen, uh, we might be converting it to an internal representation. Um, Lubo, do you, do you know if that's true or not? We don't use converters. Okay. Okay, then I think um, this is not um, relevant to us. It is relevant if you put a rule that says that we only support one. Because if someone wants to support two, we need to, to have it probably then. They need to consider it. It's like a cost. Let's say that they will do version two. Version two will mean that you need to support it like you said now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh... Let me do some more digging around how the exact conversion happens currently in terms of alpha. Like we had alpha v1 alpha 3 API that was present with v1 API. I will take a look at how reading and writing from both those APIs work. And then um, as a follow-up item to the next call, um, will determine if this is um, really important or not. But at least the gist of it is important because if we have two versions, we should be able to uh, round trip them with both the versions with no loss of information. 
so um the overall idea here maybe we can morph it that if we are serving two version um both of those versions should be readable uh, but internally how do we achieve it um, we can discuss it um, in in a follow up call maybe next next time Sure. Okay. Okay. Then the next um, existing clients need not be aware of your change in order for them to continue to function as they previously did, even without your change in use. I I think this is a rewording of these three, um, but it's good to explicitly call out. I think for us, at least, I, I'm not sure if we have decided on um, what version queue we will support, but informally it has been plus and minus one. So at least for those, um, we need to make sure that um, existing, like minus one client is able to talk to um, current server and uh, Vice versa. The next call is um, the the next bullet point is it must be possible to roll back to previous version of API server that does not include your change and have no impact on the API objects which does which does not um, use the change. API objects that use the change will be impacted in case of uh, a rollback. I think for us, this is a good bullet point to strive to, but we don't currently have a uh, rollback uh, tested in any form. So I'm not sure if we will be able to validate this one, but in principle, it's something we should have it in our uh, compatibility definition. This this is between version of the API. Yeah. So for example, if you have a v11 deployed today, and for some reason the upgrade does not work as expected, you should be able to roll back to v10 without any API breaking changes. Uh, the only API breaking changes that should be impacted is the SKU, right? So if you are using features that are only present in v11 and not present in v10, then that is allowed. Apart from that, everything should work as expected. So I, I, there is sorry, it's like sorry for if I have you have noise in the background. Um, I'm not clear if this is let's say that we have a G a v1 API and. And you you add a, a, a new field to the V1 API. Mm -hmm. So there are two two rollbacks here. One is if you go from V1 to V to V2 al uh, alpha or beta, right? For the V for the API mm -hmm. itself, or you just upgrade still in V1 API but with a new field, for example, or with a field that has a new value. Yeah, so, so I think it's the how? second case. So the case is that V1, so we have a stable API, API V1, right? But the Kubernetes, sorry, Kubert version, uh, V1, one introduced a new field to that uh, stable uh, GA API. And user has upgraded from V1 where that API field is not present to keyboard version v11 where that api field is present so this bullet point says that that user should be able to downgrade to keyboard version v10 uh, and the only thing that breaks is that new api field everything else in the v1 api should be working exactly as expected okay <laughs> 
and yeah so with that context what i was saying is that it is good thing for us to aspire to but i'm not sure if we ever uh test test uh rolling back or downgrades in ci so i'm not sure if um like put it in another way whenever we have that downgrade support in in terms of ci testing we should be able to you know achieve this um with validation So I yeah, think, just, yeah, go ahead. No, I'm just saying, yes, you're right. The only, the point is that we don't, we are not even supported. We are saying that we are not supporting it. Yeah, I, I think there is a gray area here somewhere where we informally support downgrade, but we don't have, uh, we don't have a test to represent that, or we don't even have any, uh, any user coming to us and saying that okay we have downgraded and we were successful at rolling back one version so uh, i'm not of, like, i'm uh, maybe lubo knows but i i'm not i don't know that we are we said anywhere that we are supporting the downgrade it's like we are not so that's like no we don't um, so... oh i don't know for the beginning, but I don't think we ever wanted to. Oh, so we, yeah, that's news for me. I thought informally we would allow at least one version of downgrade. Uh, the open case is what happens to a user where they upgraded and something failed in their upgrade and they want to roll back. They just need to know that it's not possible. They need to use maybe staging or something like that. Like, but I think this is like even on the downstream uh, yeah. of covert pro projects, it's not supported. But maybe it needs to be supported. But that's like a different topic. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I think it will be probably good uh, improvement. But I, yeah, it's a lot of work. So. Investment. Yeah. So I think some of the work that we do here in terms of making sure the API is good might help make that case easier, but I agree. Uh, it's a lot of work. Um, I think at the minimum, we should document this, that we don't support downgrade. And if we don't support downgrade, then I think this point becomes um, irrelevant for us. Okay, let me take some notes here. Uh, um, Lubo or Edward, um, do you know what would be a good place to document this or is it documented already? We have a user guide with uh, updates, I think. So maybe there. Okay. Okay. Um, so I think that's all I had for this particular uh, topic. So what I will do is, I think we have all agreed that out of those six points, uh, four are relevant one two three and five and we sh i will update the proposal doc with this crisp definition of what compatibility means uh, and yeah we that will make that proposal document more complete
Okay. So I think that le leads us to the next um discussion. So for folks who have not been part of this discussion is we reviewed one of the API, uh, one of the API facing change. It, it was in this PR, 10302. And just for folks, um, going to give a summary of what this PR does. It adds an API field to VMI status. This is an optional field with an omit empty, although a plus optional is missing, um, which is the open API tag uh, like this on this field. Um, internally, this field is represented by another struct, which has um, int float and float in 64 float, 64 float, 64 fields. These are also uh, omit empty uh, fields. So one of the open questions last time was that if, if we require this struct to be optional and omit empty, do we require the internal uh, fields of that struct to be optional and omit empty? That was question number one. And question number two, would it make sense for these fields to be uh, required and not be omit empty? The reason being that sample count and average and variance seems like uh, the set of fields that would either be updated all at once or they will never be updated at all. So in terms of API, would it make more sense to have these fields required, but have the outer struct uh, option? So in order to test this, I came up with a sample uh, set of uh, fields. Uh, is this font visible or should I? Well, let me, yeah. It should be more visible now. So in order to prove this out, um, I came up with a sample uh, struct fields. So here we have VMI without guest, tech, guest stats. So this represents a type with which is current without this PR. This VMI represents the type that will be the next cubebot version. So this will be V12. And this VMI um, with beta stats represents a type where in case this guest stats uh, needs to change for some reason, um, we will introduce a new beta uh, field in, in V1, keyboard V13, uh, where this will change, let's say sample count went from int to string. So we will have a converter from uh, stats to stats beta. This is a bad example, but just for some reason, we need to um, change the type or um, add new fields or or change the uh, type of existing field. This example showcase how we could do that. So this is again, V1, 2, this is V1, 3, and this is V1, uh, 4 with, with a evolution of this. So with, with these three um, version evolution, what I found is that the uh, outer struct can be omit empty and the inner struct can be required and that will not at all break any of the uh, compatibility principles that we have um, just went through. And the reason for that is outer struct, um, which either the older client will know about or it will not know about. Since it is optional, um, both the older and the newer client can work with uh, that struct being present or not present. So we have avoided um, breaking backward compatibility by making this omit empty and we can keep the um, 
outer inner fields uh, required. Uh, for anyone who wants to, you know, dig into more uh, scenarios of um, this sample um, API, I have linked with the playground um, code here. So you can go um, take a look. But I want to pause here. Um, Edward, Lugo, do you guys have um, questions around this? I think, Edward, you were mentioning that it would be more ideal to have the inner fields as required. And I think this proves out that we should be OK in terms of compatibility to have that um, uh, implemented. Yeah, it looks uh, yeah, looks good then. I, but I have a question about the the upper. I remember you were saying that the for the upper one in general, if you have omit empty, you that you need to make it a a pointer and it's like a must or something like that. Is it still like that or not? Like you remember, like if we need, yes. to, do we need? Yeah, so I have not created a scenario for that, but uh, <clears throat> at least the API documentation here makes it a requirement. And the reason for that is as follows. So Golang, so when you do this kind of conversion, right? Uh, let me go back to my playground. So let's say here, right? So if I remove this variance field and make it um, required, right? Well, if I remove this variance field and make it omit empty, then what will happen is for, uh, for JSON objects, which does not have this field, that uh, because it is an optional thing and it is not a pointer, it will default to zero. Uh, now, the problem is that, well, at least the Kubernetes authors say that you cannot predict when the default distinction of whether this field is actually defaulted to zero or it's defaulted because of the Go conversion uh, you cannot predict at the time of creating the API whether this distinction is needed in its usage or not. So as a safety path, uh, they advise that all the fields uh, except maps, slices, um, which are by default pointers, uh, should be a pointer so that in the future, if you do happen to make a distinction between it being defaulted uh, or it not being initialized by the user, you can have that option. Uh, I guess I guess we, yeah, it can be, it's like a general rule that is simpler, but uh, what you just said, uh, but in theory, in, in, in reality, it's like if the, if the, if the default value of the variable uh, like in this, if it's an integer from it's zero, or if it's a string is an empty string, if they are valid values or can be in the future valid values, then you must use a pointer. But if they are not valid values, then like if zero is never a valid value, then uh, like, for example, the number of CPUs, if the, if the number of CPUs uh, must be a positive number, then zero is okay to have it as a as a default. Like it's it's like I didn't define it because zero is an explicit zero is just saying it's nothing. So it's I guess it's a, if if the default value is a, sorry the initialized value zero value of a of a type is a val is a valid value or not? That's that's I guess it's the yeah, could consider that, that. Yeah, that makes sense. So it, remember, these are general guidelines, right? Yeah. So in order to make it simpler and consistent, I think we should use the same guideline. And if there are cases where an exception would cause 
a lot of simplification, we could grant that exception. But as a general case, we should um, strive to do that. And one of the main reasons for that is if we ever want to get to a place where we can find out these corner cases or implement automation where the API review is done through these guidelines automatically, um, we should be like having a simpler guideline like that will be better um, to, you know, open, keep possibility of that uh, open in the future. Yeah, it makes sense to me. It's like you decouple from the, you decouple the API rules from the, the specific case. It, it, just yeah. well, I don't care what is the specific case. I would just take a general rule and that's it. No thinking. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and I think I know of some projects that have started to uh, create automation around finding uh, bad CRs on upgrades. I'm not able to dig into exactly how they achieve it, but my high level understanding is if guidelines are clear and on the safer side of things, then those kinds of tools will have easier time to do their work. So, yeah. Okay. So I think that's all I had. So for this PR, I'm going to um, recommend two things from SIG API uh, discussion. One is to make this uh, optional. Um, like it is here, so open API can see it. And second, um, consider making this um, required since these all fields can be, um, it makes sense for them to be um, together and initiated only if the others are present. And yeah, those are the two things from this call. The third thing, um, that is left for me to follow up on is that this PR introduces uh, a new a gRPC API. Um, we discussed last time whether that was needed or not is not actually um, brainstormed. So as a follow-up item, I will um, do that brainstorming next time around. That gRPC one is internal, just just for you to know, right? Yeah, it is internal, but the reason why it's important to do that brainstorming is um, there was a question on how um, upgrades will go because during an upgrade, you have a situation where the word handlers have upgraded to newer uh, gRPC API, whereas uh, API server is still older and the controller is older. So yes. older, yeah. So I don't know how safe it is during the upgrade time. It looks like it will be safe because handlers are updated first. So you would have, you will have uh, the API, well, this API is actually in the launcher. So the VMIs that are older will not have that API and the handler upon upgrade will start making calls for, for that API. So yeah, I, I, I think I need to spend time uh, thinking about the scenarios like I did here yeah. Um, yeah, on how to in general, this one is uh, we are. This is this one is pretty. I will say easy because uh, in production it happens a lot. Like uh, existing VMs are not. We consider them still working even even if the cluster got upgraded. So we must consider our existing VMs that run. Uh, we must consider them. So if if such a if we break something like that, then it will blow up. So I think we even have tests. We are doing even tests for this. 
Uh, okay. I think the upgrade flow is supposed to check this as well. But anyway, this one specifically is thought about, but yes, if we can put them into writing, I think maybe there is even something written. I'm not sure, but uh, then it would be great. Okay. I would say it, sure. it is sub optional, sub optimal right now. Uh, so if we can do improvements here, uh, that would just help. Yeah, do you do you uh -huh. remember if we have it uh, written? Because I remember something, but I'm not. It's like very blurred to me. I actually think we don't have anything yet there. And um, apart from so, uh, two things. So uh, one was that we have gRPC on the launcher, but we also have gRPC on the handler side. So we have both ways. And also there is an another API or, yeah. So basically the libre domain can be. Uh, taken as an API because the domain is transferred to the newer uh, image version of the launcher. And that needs to also uh, keep working with the older format of the Libert uh, domain. So uh, that's something we should probably explore and document and uh, test properly. So um, Lubo, there are two things there one is the libert domain api itself and the other is the grpc api that the libert or the word launcher pod exposes when you describe are you talking about one or the other or uh, both of them both of them Uh, makes sense to me. So I think as an action item for a follow-up discussion, I will explore how changing this API leads, well, whether changing this API leads to problem during upgrade or not. Um, we have, do we have tests for that? Um, and if not, how can we write up something? Um, scopes for improvement. I'll try to take a look at those. Okay, I think we can help you at the, at the beginning. So there are tests that are, uh, we have, I think the operate, operator tests are upgrading the cluster. So they upgrade the root handler and the root controller and stuff like that. I think they leave the the VMI intact, right? Right, right. Yeah. right. So but that's like testing uh, that part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, but you don't uh, exercise the the gRPC by that. What I mean no, is, it, it can be co completely broken, but the VMI would still run. No, it is. I think it is. For example, the sync VMI. It is like uh, main main. The in the reconcile loop, it calls the sync VMI command, right? And that yes. one is 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 uh, executed. So you can consider a sync. I think VMI itself is the well, command and explore it. But yes, it, you don't test all of them, right? Yeah, but even if, even if the sync will fail, you might not see it uh, from the test. So yes. the sync itself can fail, and we would not notice. Yeah, I mean, just that we are exercising the scenario. Maybe we are not uh, asserting enough or good enough, but yeah. we, are, uh, we are exercising it. Uh, what we are not exercising is that uh, I mean, something beyond the relation between the root handler and, and the VMIs that are run. If there is such a thing, then we are not checking it, which is so, complicated, I guess. Edward and Libo, um, for my knowledge, uh, which is the test, upgrade test? Is it enabled for all PRs? Can we take a look at one of them right now? Yeah, it is the operator lane you have highlighted. Okay. And uh, I let me... Oh. It is a super we... complicated one, so be careful. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we have that uh, artifact for... So usually some of the tests have most together right this one does not seem to have most together you probably want the jmonit file 
or just uh, yeah, you can expand the the pass test. Okay. The green the green thing uh, that would be and look something like update. Yeah, I think it's this one. So um, what, why I was interested in the must gather is that <clears throat> I think what this PR does is that currently if, if it has an older VMI, but if the word handler is newer, all it will do is try to call that gRPC API and if that call fails, it will log an error. It will not, uh, because this is stats and read only, it will not fail the uh, domain itself. So this might be the case where because of the nature of the change, um, we will only be able to find out whether it's actually broken or not if we take a look at the logs. So what I expected is um, during an upgrade, if newer word handler is called like calling the older domain, you will get a spam of um, logs with error message, and that's what I was looking for. Yes, but if the if the test doesn't fail, you don't have these logs collected. Okay, got it. Uh, that's I think this one is failed. Okay. Yeah, so in this case, you, you would see some uh, logs. Uh, By the way, the, the tests are not really, mm, how to say, maybe readable or well, well organized. And it has like two or 3,000 of lines. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> Make sure you are prepared when you are going to read them. Yeah. Thanks for the heads up. So I think this was crashing. Yeah, this crashed. I think. Yeah, I, I think if this is the change. Okay. So I think it crashed and then we fixed it. So I think what Lou, uh, what Edward is saying is correct like for some of the cases if the break is bad where things panic then we should be able to catch it in the ci but for cases where it gets silently ignored uh, we'll have to take a look at the logs okay i think this is very informative thanks guys Okay, I think that covers the things I have. Um, Edward, for um, next time or whenever you get a chance, I think it will be great to have the um, feature flag um, discussion sometime. I think I've 
um, we found uh, a PR in six scale call where it might make sense to keep a feature flag um, intact for performance reasons, even if the feature goes to GA. So I, I think those examples will be great to bring up during that discussion. Okay. Okay, I think that's all I had folks. Um, if anyone does not have anything, we can um, save 10 minutes on this call. I have one quick note. Um, so we have a deprecation policy or some kind of deprecation policy where we state, well, for the feature gates to be deprecated, we make them default. Now, I uh, I don't think that's what we want uh, in general. I think we want to have a two cases, one which is a graduation of the feature gate and one is deprecation of the feature gate. Um, in case of graduation, we probably won't need to be on uh, by default. And in case of graduation, we don't want it to be the, uh, on, on by default because we want to probably remove some kind of uh, or deprecate some kind of functionality. Um, what do other things about this? We think this is a uh, cover by Kubernetes itself pretty clearly. Like they are in alpha, if I'm not mistaken, this is the, what they did is that in alpha, it is by default disable the feature gate. Then you, uh, if you move to beta, it is by default enabled, but that's like questionable if we want to do that as well here, uh, but it is enabled in beta by default. And in GA, the feature gate itself is gone and you will just get a, it's like a no op or a warning that you don't need a feature gate, it doesn't matter. And if you don't go to GA, if you go to removal, it's because you can you can go from removal from alpha, which is easy. From beta, it's it's less easy. But if you from beta, you say you don't want it, then it's just gone. It's like they remove it completely, and that's it. And if you, you, you the feature, if you try to enable the feature gate, I guess it will tell you that uh, it's it's it was removed. And it doesn't work anymore. Yeah, is I this think, what yeah. you mean? Yeah, I mean, Kubernetes does have it uh, covered. Um, I, I, I shared a link um, to the, to our deprecation policy uh, regarding the feature gate. And uh, this is what I would like to uh, change for now. Yeah, I think that, I think what the, I remember this, uh, this policy. I think the, the problem or the challenge here is that uh, the the deprecation policy came from from a specific angle, like we it was attacked from a specific uh, direction, and I think we should we should uh, go through uh, go to reach the deprecation thing. We need to go through from the other direction, from the direction that that what is the life cycle of the of a feature, and then the deprecation is only one. It's one of the options. It's like, it should not come from the, let's de uh, let's decide what is the deprecation policy. No, we should we should define the life cycle policy. I think this is, we tried to do that. And one of the parts of this life cycle is the deprecation. And then it will make more sense. Yeah, yes. so, sounds good to me. Yeah. So I think one case that I was mentioning earlier was that so, um, Lugo, you remember that uh, PR, which increases the uh, memory requirement um, for yes. for the um, logs, serial logs to be streamed by 35 megabytes. So for that specific example, even though the feature goes to GA, we might want the feature flag to stay in GA because for users, advanced users who want to optimize for that 35 MB, but 
they don't care about serial logs, they can turn the feature flag off. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think I we might use that uh, feature gate. So um, the reason why I'm mentioning is that if we talk about the um, feature evolution uh, or life cycle, like Edward was mentioning, and then define this policy, I think that would cover all such examples. Um, and it will give us more defined cases where we can deprecate and when we should not. I think Kubernetes came up with this deprecation because their feature flags were too much. Like at some point, Kubelet had so many, so many features and, and the flags for it. So they had to yeah. manage the volume and fields there. But for us, it might not make sense. Yes, yes. Just be, think... just be, sorry. Sorry, Lobo, go ahead. <laughs> thank, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that probably few feature gates can be removed after the RGA, but I see the point where you want to keep them uh, around and be able to disable, and disable them if it's, it's not like, um, let's say, core feature in Kubernetes. Yeah. Or not for all use cases. So I uh, my only comment here is that uh, this what you are trying what you are saying now is uh, you need to be a bit careful because you are making the feature gate uh, uh, a parameter of, a, of actual feature so you don't want that like the feature flag is just to say that it is experimental it's in maybe you could call it a, a preview like in beta and then GA, it should not say anything about uh, a feature that you want to keep. Like if you want a parameter that says what is the default, you want to change the default uh, memory buffer or something like that, then it's it's a some it's a feature. It's not a, it needs to be a feature. You need to consider it. Don't don't think about the feature gate as a as a as a parameter, a regular parameter of a value. This is what it's like. Yeah, it, makes sense. So basically yeah. you want the feature gate to be decoupled with the configuration of the feature. And yeah, so if the I, configuration, if, yeah. So for example, if uh, what you said, let's say that you are saying that if you have a feature gate, it increases the memory by 50, right? Something like that. Like the default is now different. Then it means that if you end enable the if you start the feature gate, then you add the value, and the value you could set the memory or and this is uh, or you can set the default value value in this parameter. But in the feature gate can be gone, but that value will remain. That's it. This is what it means. That the value will remain, not uh, but the feature gate is not a replacement of a hidden value behind it. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think this is going into a totally different discussion. We can probably have that in, in yeah, the next so. call. Yeah. No, because I tried to do the same thing and uh, I realized I'm doing exactly this. <laughs> it was, it was, uh, yeah, never mind. Okay, yes, you're right. We should talk about it uh, specific on a, as, a, as a, its own topic. Agree. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanks, folks. Thank you. Um, we'll see you next week. Bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. See you. Bye. -bye.